liberty. Uh, but the issue here for some is, uh, is this an unconnected digression? Why did he use his own example from the issue of idol to sudden shift to apostolic right of support? And uh, see here, there are some four rhetorical questions, all of which uh, expect an affirmative answer. For sure, the Apostle Paul uh, use this digression, but it has a connection. He used this digression to explain himself as a, an example of what he has said in chapter 8. A uh, first question, am I not free? Am I not, second, am I not an apostle? Third, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Fourth, are you not, are not you my workmanship in the Lord? So, uh, Paul here is obviously free and undoubtedly an apostle was the rights because he saw the Lord Jesus and he planted the church. So in other words, he is trying to establish his authority, his legal identity before them, that he is a rightful uh, a person who has rights that uh, he has achieved because he is an apostle, he is their pastor, he is a church planter, so he deserves these things. Yet what did he do? Uh, there are three rhetorical questions <clears throat> that uh, uh, reveal. There are uh, three uh, rhetorical questions. <clears throat> Sorry. There are uh, uh, three rhetorical questions. Uh, questions uh, that the Apostle Paul has uh, uh, mentioned here. Uh, first, the right to food and drink, uh, basic necessities uh, to survive. This is one of the most obvious uh, things that he mentioned here. He has this right to eat, and then uh, uh, he has the right to take along a believing wife in the ministry. Understandably, the apostles have their own families. They have these uh, rights. And then, uh, by the way, this, uh, uh, or letter C, uh, there is the right to receive financial support from churches because uh, they need this so that they will not be distracted from ministry by earning a living. But uh, trying to go first to uh, the second right, that is to take a believing wife, uh, the terminology there, here is Adelphen uh, Gunaika. Uh, the Adelphen Gunaika is a sister's wife. And for many, many years in the early church, they have believed that uh, Paul was talking about uh, not a wife of the pastor, uh, a female, according to Tertullian, a female attendant that ministered to the apostles. And this was followed by other church fathers, uh, if you notice that many of our church fathers remained uh, unmarried because they have followed this reading, even Clement of Alexandria, uh, it uh, speaks of a Christian sister rather than a spouse. But the best translations now we see in our modern versions, this is only speaking of a believing wife, the wife of the minister, uh, because uh, the Bible has a very clear uh, understanding on uh, ministers having the right and the freedom to marry. And then, of course, the last one is the right to receive financial support from churches. So Paul's a tenor implies that they do not have this, not because it is not their right, but that they waive those rights. So you see, uh, it was not taken from them. They have freely given them. Why? And Paul will reveal that it is for the higher purpose. So there are so five strong arguments to show that there are these legitimate rights of the apostles that they are to be supported. The first one is the common practice. There are three rhetorical questions that acts as metaphors from uh, daily life. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, a soldier who serves as a soldier at his own expense. Uh, with this picture, you see a German soldier. Uh, who do you think uh, spent uh, his, uh, for, who paid for his uh, uh, binoculars, uh, 
his gear, his uh, weapon, uh, all these things. You cannot expect a soldier would spend on his own just to have this and protect his country. The No, the government that he serves is the one paying for this. That is a common practice in nature. That is why this is the argument of the Apostle Paul. The second one is a man who plants a vineyard. Uh, if you have planted a vineyard, who owns that uh, tree? Assuming, uh, assumingly that it is you who owns it. So in the horticult uh, horticultural life, you are the one who would uh, uh, have or who owns the fruits of the tree that you have planted. And then third one, how about a, a who tends a flock without getting some of the milk in poultry livelihood? Uh, you own, uh, you are working, and then you would not have a part on the milk that is provided. So all illustrations show compensations are derived intrinsically from the work, not external. So in other words, the design of God is that you would benefit in, uh, intrinsically from your work, not external you're be giving your life you're focusing your life on this uh, work and then you would expect that other people or other means uh, would be your provision uh, it cannot be then there's that scriptural precept in verses 8 to 10 Paul makes a stronger case by appealing to the law of Moses according to Deuteronomy 25 4 you shall not muzzle an ox when it is treading out the grain so now there is a question here. How come that Paul was talking about some agricultural matter in Deuteronomy 25.4? Paul connected it to pastoral support because he said that Moses wrote it not for the ox, but for us. <laughs> so how, how practice of allegorical interpretation and proof texting? Did he just try to... Uh, get some text from the Old Testament just to justify his own argument. But let's listen to Anthony T. Selton. Contrary to popular misunderstanding, Paul seldom grubs isolated proof texts out of the air, but knows full well as a trained student of Scripture the context that surrounds his citations. In the context surrounding Deuteronomy 25.4, the laws in the main uh, all serve to promote dignity and justice for human beings. Since it is in Christ that humankind finds what it is to be human as God purposed humanity to be, these ideals for humanity relate to God speaking in our interest. That is the hemas in Greek or on our account in this Deuteronomy passage. This is an example of allegorical interpretation. Paul conceives of Old Testament revelation as a historical unfolding of God's will for his people. You see, what is really happening here is the argument from lesser to greater. And this is an established method of interpretation. What Paul is saying is what was true to this ox that you would not try to cover his mouth when he's working. What you would do is you would feed him. So if you do that to a lesser form of creation in the animal called ox, how much more in the greater issue of ministry which a minister giving his own life trying to teach and preach the word and then you would uh, want him to starve to death so this is impossible according to Paul. Harge uh, reflects he only means to say that the law had a higher reference although the proximate end of the command was that the laboring brute should be treated justly Yet its ultimate design was to teach men the moral truth involved in the precept. If God requires that even the ox which spends his strength in our service should not be defrauded of his reward, how much more strict will he be in enforcing the application of the same principle of justice to his rational creatures? So Romans 15.4 is correct that all scriptures were written for our encouragement so that we would gain strength, comfort, consolation by the scripture. So while the Deuteronomy wrote, while Moses wrote about the ox, the intention, spiritual intention of God is that you see, this is how my government, uh, everyone, especially giving Jew what, what is due to working 
create uh, creatures. And then there is this uh, uh, argument of intrinsic justice in verses 11-12. Uh, Paul brings his argument to its logical conclusion. Sowing spiritual things result in expectation of reaping, money, reaping money, material benefit. This is not a new teaching from Paul, but from Jesus himself. Remember in Luke 10.7, Jesus said, and remain in the house, eating and drinking what they do not go from house to house. So the policy of the apostle uh, of Jesus Christ himself in the ministry is you go to people who will accept you. And then uh, if they would close uh, their doors, you do not waste your uh, uh, your uh, meager resources and your uh, strength in these people. What you would do is go and find those people who would be persuaded by your own words. So therefore, there is that kind of uh, uh, principle of... Uh, Uh, rewarding those laborers. Again, Taylor helps us to understand this. This line of reasoning not only extends of sowing uh, reaping language appropriate to the agricultural example of the ox, but employs once again the lesser greater logic in the verse. If those who labor in ministry sow spiritual things, the greater, then should they not as uh, at least reap a material harvest, the lesser, Furthermore, if others use this right to support from the Corinthians, even more so do Paul and Barnabas possess the same right. So you see, there should be justice. And if we would want justice in everything, uh, this uh, should be understood as a right. And then in verse 13, there's this Jewish custom. The Jewish custom... Uh, Uh, Tahera refers to the cult in general, uh, but obviously Paul has in mind the Jewish temple service. So uh, Paul mentioned what the Levites uh, did or that was that were done to them in the Old Testament, uh, like the plowman and the plodding oxen. Priestly duties in the temple entail real work, so doesn't matter if they are not uh, literally uh, plowing in. The farm, uh, it is enough for them that they work inside the temple. Hence, they are entitled to be sustained by the very work that they do. So by using this Levitical parallel from the Old Testament, Paul is strengthening his argument. But I think the most supreme of all is the fifth one, the command of Christ. And what is the command of Christ? This is the highest level of authority Paul can employ. That's why he uh, made it the last one. Jesus command uh, that Jesus himself commanded this. Uh, how? How do we know? Well, you see in verse 14, the words in the same way or in King James, even so, hotos kai, the Lord's command accords with reason, common practice and in secular and religious occupations and Old Testament law. The Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live by the gospel. So this is, He used the word diataxin, you know, taxonomy, naming, uh, to arrange by name, so to arrange thoroughly, to charge or appoint. So the gospel preachers be supported by the ministry is God's sovereign design that transcends human wisdom. Oh, maybe you would be like me, how we wish that while we do our public ministry full-time, uh, the money that we need to feed for our families would just go directly from heaven so that we would not need to preach uh, about money, about giving, uh, lest we be uh, construed or to be uh, uh, accused of uh, peddling the word of God. But you see, the grand design of God is to teach many things to his people not only to rebuke and to sanctify them uh, us by by mortifying our own covetousness especially our members including us as pastors but one of the designs of god is this is how the ministry would work this is this is god given design so let's proceed 
What did Paul do after establishing that he had these rights? Well, he refused to exercise his rights. Why? According to verse 12 and 15, we have not made use of this right, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. So I'm not writing these things so that I could get some support. That This is what he said. Verse 12, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel. And then in verses 15 to 8, for 18, for I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. So you see, the Apostle Paul is showing a very beautiful example of, of uh, giving up one's own freedom for the sake of a higher purpose. And the higher purpose that he is showing is to be able to preach the gospel in a more effective manner. And according to Paul, he, we should also do the same. We should be ready to give up our own rights if uh, this means that the higher purpose are at stake, like loving our brethren, saving our brethren from offenses, and not only that, failing to show them with love and trying to make the gospel more effective, more fragrant to other people. Riddle Barger uh, once more says, Paul probably means that even though he preaches the gospel freely and without pay, nevertheless, he is entitled to a reward, wage. Since Paul has been called by Christ and is therefore a slave of Christ, he has no choice but to do as he has done. He is fulfilling that obligation which Jesus Christ has laid upon him. Paul is responsible to God and can do nothing else but preach Christ crucified. He asks, what then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. Paul has to preach. He can do nothing else. In a sense, he is saying it is his proper pay to preach without being paid. While the gospel gives him certain rights, pay included, it is his personal privilege not to exercise these rights if he so chooses. Wow, what an apostle in the apostle Paul. Paul is not concerned with his rights, but in his calling as a slave and preacher of Christ. So uh, this is a warning to us. Let us beware of ministering for the sake of wage and money because it is not only unchristian, it is also disqualifying. What is the last portion of chapter 9? If you are not willing as a pastor, as a Christian, to give up your rights for higher purposes according to 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, you will be disqualified because you are trying to uh, take care first of your own ego, of your own personal interests. Barrett, uh, in his commentary, says, The gospel which turned upon the love and self-sacrifice of Jesus could not fitly be presented by preachers who insisted on their rights, delighted in the exercise of authority, and made what profit they could out of the work of evangelism. So uh, here, uh, it is a sober reminder to us. Let me just give you some quick pastoral lessons. Uh, number one, giving up our freedom for the sake of the weak brother shows that we accept those whom Christ has already accepted. So Why do I need to be sensitive and to take care of my brother? Because that is the way I demonstrate that I also accept him. Even though I see him that uh, he is wrong on this matter, yet I accept him because Christ has already accepted him. Secondly, Paul's example of waiving his rights of pastoral support must challenge our views on the subject. So there should be a balance here. First, we must evaluate ourselves if we are still ministering out of the compulsion of Christ's love or money has taken a bigger role in consideration uh, in our ministry. Um, may we not uh, 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 fall into this kind of uh, uh, trick, especially you know when uh, you have been Uh, in the ministry for so long and uh, it has become normal to you that you are being supported and you receive some stipends, love gifts and love offerings. Uh, sometimes it becomes uh, an issue for some. Uh, for example, one pastor told me that when uh, his pastor tried 
uh, when he was not yet a pastor, his pastor tried to invite uh, in their circle. Uh, their circle is known for, you know, preaching on giving almost every Sunday. So uh, he has his, pa his pastor asked a prominent preacher uh, to preach on giving, to have a conference about that. And, you know, the speaker said, do you have this kind of amount that you would give me? Uh, if not, uh, try to look for other preachers first. So this is obviously trying to make money out of the word of God. And we should not, uh, we should be sensitive that we will avoid this. So uh, because failure to do so will destroy our credibility and fitness to the ministry. And number three, having a willingness, willingness to sacrifice our rights must not erode in the lack of biblical teaching on pastoral support. You cannot use this text to destroy the beautiful teaching of pastoral support. In fact, this is one of the chapters, beautiful chapters on pastoral support, that the intention of the ministry is full-time. We will not be able to achieve it always in every situation, but that should be our intention. Uh, Paul, stent making is not the norm of pastoral support. So if you are a pastor and you're the only pastor in your church and you're doing tent making, well, that's good. But remember, your intention and direction should be to aim for full-time ministry because the ministry under New Testament understanding should be full-time uh, with all those work of preaching, teaching, and oversight. Uh, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, the man of God should not be entangled with affairs. It's okay to have business and to have some extra uh, uh, things that could support us. But uh, as a pastor, our intention is we should not allow anything to uh, hinder us from being effective ministers. So the idea, ideal direction to any preacher is full-time ministry. Because the issue is, this is what I have been teaching our church, the issue is always regularity. There should be regular support because the ministry is regular. You cannot close next Sunday. You cannot close next month because of high uh, uh, prices or this and that. That is why uh, the ministry should be supported regularly. And then under normal situation, God's ordained means for ministry is support from God's people. Uh, the, the illustrations of Paul is the government that benefits the soldier is the one who will support. The farmer who planted the tree would benefit from the tree. The uh, 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 shepherd who was milking the, uh, his own sheep or cow would benefit from the milk. So we should we reject the position that it is the government that should fund our churches. Uh, it should not be because uh, we have rejected that sacral society. Then this will avoid ingratitude on the part of the ministers or the church. There should be a, uh, a, a an accountability uh, from the church to. The minister and the temptation for some ministers who are not being paid by the church is uh, they would feel not all, but there is the temptation of arrogance uh, in times of difficulty. It is tempting to say, you know, you are not you are not even paying me, so you cannot touch me on this matter. So there should be that accountability in the church. That's the wisdom of God behind pastoral support uh, in our confession. Chapter 26, paragraph 10, the work of pastors being constantly to attend the service of Christ in his churches, in the ministry of the word and prayer, with watching for their souls, as they must, that miss, must give an account to him, it is incumbent on the churches to whom they minister, not only to give them all due respect, but also to communicate to them all, of all their good things according to their ability, so as they may have a comfortable supply, without being themselves entangled in secular affairs, and may also be capable of exercising hospitality towards others. And this is required by the law of nature and by the express order of our Lord Jesus, who hath ordained that they that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Any question, brothers, in our uh, lecture? Questions?
uh, Pau from GSCF, how about po if a pastor has already both work outside but also being supported enough by the congregation, is it preferable to give up the outside work? Uh, well, there is no uh, hard and fast rule on this. Uh, it should be a matter of uh, testimony uh, to the church uh, if uh, his work uh, is not actually hindering him on being an effective uh, pastor, especially if he's being paid uh, to care for the flock. Uh, we know in GMA how uh, uh, how uh, uh, how uh, hard uh, a pastor should labor, especially in preparing sermons uh, and even in oversight. Uh, how much more uh, should we we should give ourselves uh, more to this ministry? So. Uh, if he has a business that can be operated, even if he will not spend much time, I, I think it is uh, it should be okay. But uh, it would depend upon the uh, wisdom and the uh, need of the flock. Uh, if there would be a conflict, uh, we just hope that this pastor should choose to uh, uh, focus in the ministry rather than uh, uh, focusing himself on the uh, secular affairs of this world. Uh, Joel Ramos, uh, sorry, jo Joel Kikalo, Pastor Joel. Good afternoon, po. Uh, what do you think might happen if a pastor is a volunteer pastor and not a full time one? Do, do you mean volunteer, someone that is not uh, being paid? Uh, he's not a full time. Well, for uh, 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 the meantime, and in some abnormal situation, this could be uh, good. And uh, it can exist in a very fruitful manner uh, because uh, you don't pay him and there is uh, that kind of advantage. But in the long run, in the long run, uh, knowing that this is not the official design of God in 1 Corinthians uh, 9, uh, we know that this will have uh, uh, adverse or negative repercussions. I think it will not be healthy uh, in the end or after a long time, because uh, the church will not be conscious of, his res of, its, of her responsibility to support for the pastor in a full-time manner, and they would uh, <clears throat> deprive themselves of the care of a pastor <clears throat> that would be full-time, because if he gets support from others, he would always get money or support from other means. So if he has a business, then therefore he would have to spend much time on his business uh, rather uh, unless there are some very highly uh, rare cases, abnormal cases, wherein you know he just receives money from his pension and he has uh, uh, he has accumulated some wealth, but still, uh, if I will be a, an advisor to the church, I will advise the church that they will still pay him, and they will they will still do their best to pay him, and will not allow that he will. A regular manner without something that they sh they are not giving him. Maybe they would not be able to give him a full time support, but they should still give him some kind of uh, reward for his labor because that is biblical. And again, that would be a there would be financial accountability to others. You know, I'm saying this because uh, for some time I have seen in others and in some ministry those people were not uh, being paid, uh, it, it would be easier, much easier for them. Not all. Again, I have seen some were not being paid and they have really, uh, 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 they are very admirable on that manner. But it is easier for them to give up, to just, you know, quit it. Uh, because after all, there is no accountability and uh, the temptation to be arrogant even in their ministry uh, would be there. That's why, thank God, his wisdom is that we will be supported by our churches. Uh, we would not just quit the ministry. We would be accountable to our, to our churches, uh, even especially the way we live, the way we use our, the congregation should do to a pastor who gets involved in, in uh, uh, according to Second Timothy, he should not be entangled with the affairs of this world. Even our confession of faith uh, mentioned that. And I think everyone of us, especially if you are in the Philippines, would agree that politics here <laughs> is very a taxing 
responsibility and endeavor, not only taxing, toxic also. So he can be involved in politics, but I think he would it would be better for the church and for him if he would choose one. So if he would be involved in politics, my advice would be resign from his own ministry. Because again, we all know pastors, when they run for position for government, uh, and then they are still pastors, you know, it, it will be hard for them not to use the church, church funds, and church ministries, church platforms for their candidacy. And that's that's very hard not to happen. So uh, the church would suffer in the end. Uh, Gil, Gil Cardiel, is an itinerant pastor consistent with the scriptures. I'm sorry, I do not know what uh, what do you mean exactly by itinerant. Do you mean a pastor who travels and preaches, uh, conference speaker, something like that, who is not really a pastor, or he is a pastor who always leaves his church and then preaches in other congregation? Uh, uh, let me just answer this in, a, in this kind of way. I, I believe that you, if you are a pastor, especially if you're the only pastor, you should care for the flock. Uh, there are times that you would be invited to travel and to share your gifts to other churches. That's good. Uh, but then again, your priority should be your flock. Uh, secondly, uh, there are some people whom God has called to uh, th that he has given them gifts, not only for his own local church. Uh, they would the intention of God is that uh, their gifts are not only for one local church. Uh, maybe we will all agree that our very own principle is being used by God, not only for one local church, but for the many churches in the Reformed community. So he's one good example of that. Uh, but uh, a traveling pastor moving from one church to another, uh, I think this is, uh, uh, I don't know the real situation, but on the looks of by the looks of it, it, it appears to be unbiblical. Uh, but let me just uh, be careful with my words, because you know some people are uh, they have uh, resigned from their churches. They have seen that they will flourish if they will be conference speakers. They will travel to churches, and you know they have uh, 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 given themselves to ministry for a long time. Uh, one church I knew that uh, uh, a gifted pastor resigned because uh, he would be more effective if he will minister to many churches in the Philippines. Uh, they called him missionary at large. And, and I think that's, that's a, uh, uh, a biblical thing to do. Manaig, uh, again, is buying a church lot and building prior priority over mission works or evangelism works. What if the local church is not that uh, liquid, no much funds to be able to buy. Uh, is it correct to question what the elders in the church, uh, where is your uh, faith? Uh, I think here you should just apply wisdom and uh, uh, priorities. First, priority of the ministry is the ministry of the word. That is to support the pastor and those preaching. And the ministry is uh, to uh, support the operation of the church secondly wisdom if you are a church where you, you do not have funds and then you have no ordinary means uh, it is not wise that you would pursue a church lot or church building that is not within your means or within the uh, acceptance of the church uh, we believe we do not just act as elders or as deacons we act as a church the church should consent on your plans on that matter uh, maybe this would be the last question. Pau Peredomes, uh, should a pastor demand a fixed amount to his members when it comes to special occasions like officiating weddings? <laughs> I have officiated weddings and uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, couples give love gift to offici the offic uh, officiants, but uh, uh, it would be uh, so embarrassing to just even talk uh, how much or, you know, uh, these are practices that uh, uh, that are best uh, uh, ignored. Uh, they should not be even talked about uh, uh, 
uh, maybe some people can uh, talk about these things, uh, but not uh, on that matter wherein uh, uh, it is the pastor himself trying to do these things. Uh, that's why God gave us deacons so that uh, many people will arrange uh, these things uh, for the pastor. And for a wedding, I, I, I don't agree with that. Last na lang talaga. Ano, sabi ni Zaldi, Sandy, ano po masasabi nyo sa isang pastor who, who uh, whenever a member would give a support to a past, to other pastor, uh, it should go first to him. Uh, the church should support other pastors or other work ministry, but it is not the pastor. It is through the church. So, Uh, but you are very free to support whom you ever want to support. Uh, the teaching of the scripture is you support first your local church, then you are then supporting uh, privately other ministries, like you are supporting Desiring God and other ministries. So uh, that, that would just be fine. But priority is the local church. Now, the local church is not equivalent to the pastor. So that, that's it. Kiano has a question. Uh, the answer, Kiano, is uh, better to continue ministering for that young man, but uh, he has to find work so that he can feed himself and for his ministry and for his family until the Lord opens uh, some providential doors. Okay, so let's pray. Let's close in prayer. Uh, 